and welcome everyone to CILC's Community of Learning. Cannot wait to jump in today. So I want to hand it over to our wonderful teacher, Timothy, teacher Lydia, and our wonderful interpreter, Melissa. So take it away. We can't wait to learn what we're learning about today. Hear what we're learning about today. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It is nice to meet you. My name is Timothy. <laughs> and I am here at the Toledo Zoo in Toledo, Ohio. We are, uh, I'm going to share with you a quick uh, image. This is where you can find us. We are at the southwest end of the Great Lakes. Uh, and we want to acknowledge the indigenous peoples who lived on this land for a long time and many who continue to live here as well. Today, we are going to talk about endangered species. An endangered species is an animal or a plant or a bacteria, anything that's alive that is going down in numbers. There are fewer of them today than there used to be. The animal that we're gonna start looking at is actually an animal that has recovered. It was endangered, but now it is at a healthy population. And I will flip my camera around and show you our beautiful bald eagles. Bald eagles are a very large bird <laughs> they are amazing animals and they love to eat fish. They hunt in the water and they will swoop down from the sky and catch fish for their food. Now, they were endangered in the United States and Canada for a long time because people used a chemical called DDT. DDT was a chemical that would kill insects, but the fish who ate the insects that were killed by DDT ended up being poisonous and they ended up hurting the bald eagles. So a really smart scientist named Rachel Carson, she was able uh, to convince the government to ban DDT, to stop using that chemical so that these birds could be healthy. Now, the populations of bald eagles are very large and sustainable, meaning that they will be around for a long time as long as people don't do anything to hurt them. We have three bald eagles here. Their names are Ottawa, Mara, and Lady. And they are uh, all three females. And we have them here because they are rescues. You can visit them in person at the Toledo Zoo but we only have them because they are rescues. They were born in the wild and they have uh, been hurt or injured in a way that means that they cannot return to the wild, but we can give them everything they need to be happy and healthy here at the Toledo Zoo. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask about the bald eagles? Oh, I see Eden asked, can you pet them? No, you cannot pet them. They are wild animals. And while they don't attack people, they don't like when people touch them. So you should leave them be in the wild. I see Jennifer uh, says that they want to be a wildlife vet when they grow up. Amazing. It was wildlife vets who saved these bald eagles' lives and were able to bring them here where they can have a safe place. 
I see Tristan asked, are they chickens? They are not chickens, but like chickens, they are a type of bird, but these are eagles and they are bigger and stronger than chickens. Eden asked, do we, or what do we feed them? We feed them fish, mice, and rats. What, uh, why are the, why are they the color they are? Good question. The brown is going to help them blend in or camouflage with the trees around them. And they can hide in the forest so that the food that they want to eat doesn't see them coming. How tall are they? They are about two and a half feet tall or about two thirds of a meter tall. And someone asked, what do I like about bald eagles? I love that bald eagles make a really funny noise. They make a really squeaky sound that is kind of funny to listen to. Margarita asked, how were they injured? And Eden asked, where did we find them? And those are kind of similar questions. They were injured in different ways. Ottawa fell out of a tree. So Ottawa was unable to survive in the wild after that. Lady here, oh, <laughs> Lady was hit by a truck. Uh, when she was hit by a truck that broke her wing. And while she's able to live and be healthy, she can't fly, which means that she wouldn't be able to live in the wild. Are the males bigger than females or do they have different coloring? Males and females are going to be the same size for this bird, and they're going to have the same colors. But you will notice that Ottawa has some brown feathers on her head. That's because she is younger than the other two. As they get older, the feathers on their head turn white. And Eden asked, did they have babies? Well, they did not have babies here because these are just rescues. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, but we do have some babies here at the zoo, but these ones, since they are rescues, they do not have babies. Well, wonderful questions, everybody. I wanna make sure we get time to see lots of animals today. So I am actually going to turn it over now to my friend, Lydia, who is in our Toledo Zoo Aquarium to talk to you about some endangered animals of the ocean. All right, so in the ocean, I guess we'll start in the ocean, there are many endangered animals and endangered uh, environments like our coral reefs, but one of our stars here at the zoo is right there. She looks like she might be itching her arm or something. But that is our sea turtle. She is a green sea turtle and her name is Tink. And she is not stuck. She is just doing something silly. But you can see on the back of her, well, hello, shark. <laughs> on the back of her, she has these uh, squares and those are weights. So she has to have special weights on her back uh, so that she doesn't float up to the top. And the reason she would float is because like the eagles, uh, Tink is a rescue. So she is from the wild, but she got injured when a boat uh, struck her. And so then she got a bubble of air stuck under gel, and that makes her float. So that's why we have the weights on her so that she is more balanced in the water. And I don't know if she's trying to get something in there or just being silly, but she's not actually stuck. She looks like it, but she's not. That friendly shark there is uh, a bonnethead shark. Uh, let's see, what do we feed her? So yes, it was a motorboat. Um, we feed her, she eats only greens. So she'll eat mostly lettuce, um, but they are herbivores. They only eat plants. Uh... Why are they endangered? So they are endangered uh, for several reasons. So turtles have to come onto land to lay their eggs. So when a sea turtle comes onto land to lay their eggs, those little tiny eggs have to survive first being an egg. And then when they become a turtle, 
uh, they hatch out of their egg. They have to try to get to the ocean uh, without getting eaten. Uh, so there's a lot of things that eat little baby turtles. And that means that not very many of those turtles make it to the ocean. So there's not a high survival rate of the babies. And humans, by putting things like street lights and uh, other things, they kind of, uh, so baby turtles look at the moon to know which way to go. And so when they see the street lights, sometimes they get confused and go the wrong way. Uh, so that's one way. And sea turtles, it takes them a long time to become an adult. So when they are an adult, they have to have survived that whole time in order to have any babies. So it's just a very slow reproducing uh, animal. And since they are not as many of them left, uh, it's really hard to get their population back up again. So yes, you can see she can still swim. Her back legs are paralyzed, so she can't use her back flippers, uh, but she gets around just fine with her front ones. And all these friendly guys that keep coming up to it, uh, the video, are cow-nosed rays. So they are a type of stingray. And they're funny because I think they like the camera and sometimes they'll come and just smile at the camera. So a lot of animals will eat baby sea turtles. Uh, a lot of birds will eat them. Uh, crabs will eat them. Many, many other predators when they're trying to get from the land to the ocean. And then in the ocean, they still do have some predators uh, like tiger sharks will eat turtles. Uh, but the uh, once it is an adult, it has a lot less predators. And the only time they ever go on land is to lay eggs. Uh, she does not eat coral. She will eat in the wild, mostly like seagrass. And here she eats a lot of lettuce because we give her lettuce. There she is. So there are a couple different kinds of sea turtles. And I believe actually all the different types of sea turtles are endangered. Um, some more endangered than others, but she's a green sea turtle. Um, the size, so she is an adult. We don't know exactly how old she is because she was from the wild. Uh, so we don't know if she is uh, 40 years old or if she is 80 years old because sea turtles can live a really long time. Uh, they can live to like 150. So we don't really know how old she is. Oh, you guys get a treat. They're feeding them some little pellets at the moment. They're dropping in some food from the top. Up top, the keepers can stand over and drop in little food. Most of the time they'll eat dead fish um, that the keepers will chop up and throw in there. All of them except for Tink, because she eats uh, lettuce. Uh, what do I like about sea turtles? Uh, I like watching them in the wild. So I go scuba diving and I like to see them in the wild because they move really gracefully through the water. All right, any other questions on the turtle or other animals in this tank? All right. All right, then I'll hand it back to Timothy. Thank you very much, Lydia. We are here to see another animal. This animal is a seal. We have three species of seal here. We have California sea lions, who are really fast. We have gray seals, who are really big and strong. And then down here, we have Oh, they disappeared. They were right here just a second ago. We have harbor seals who are really good at diving. They can hold their breath for over an hour. But right now we can just see our California sea lions. Oh, here comes a gray seal, big and strong. The gray seals are from the Arctic where it's really cold. 
and they were endangered because people would hunt them for their skins. Now, for a long time, for centuries, people who live in the Arctic have hunted seals to eat them, and that is okay because they don't eat so many seals that it hurts the overall species. But when people hunt them just to get the skin, they hunt them way more than they need to, and they can end up making them endangered and even extinct. So at the Toledo Zoo, we don't say that nobody should ever hunt an animal, but you should never hunt an animal if you are trying to make a lot of money off of it or if you are uh, not using the body parts to survive. So these animals were endangered, but the United States and Canadian governments passed a law that said only indigenous people of Canada and the United States are allowed to hunt these seals. And when that law passed, the populations went back to healthy numbers. And we have a lot of these seals now. There are a lot of them. Now, I noticed somebody asked some questions, so we'll get to those. Somebody asked, why does the gray seal move so slow? If you watch the gray seal, they paddle with their back feet. Those flippers in the back are powerful, but they're not very fast. The sea lions who move really fast paddle with their front feet. Those flippers are a lot faster, so they move faster through the water. Do they have teeth? Yes, they do have teeth. They have sharp teeth. They are carnivores, so they will just eat meat, and their favorite meat is fish. Uh, somebody asked, what eats them? We will see what eats them in just one second. And someone asked, what is their story? Well, we have four sea lions, two moms and their two babies. We have an old harbor seal named Fritz, who is really cute and very friendly. Hi, Fritz. <laughs> And we have two gray seals who are really old, and one of them actually worked with the United States Navy, which is very exciting. <laughs> yeah, they don't they don't like to eat apples. They oh, you ask I see you ask another student if they eat apples. <laughs> uh, yeah, so these seals they love fish. That's their favorite food. Oh, hello, Fritz. Fritz wants to show off to everybody. You can see Fritz has those beautiful speckles on his fur, and he is so friendly. He likes to follow your hand, and he likes to play. They are very smart animals. They are still dangerous. They are not like dogs that you could have as a pet, but they are very playful animals. And so in the wild, they will like to play with each other. <laughs> you can also see his really big whiskers. Those whiskers will shake when other animals move through the water so that he can tell where other animals are, even if he can't see or hear them. Eden asked, how uh, are they dangerous or why are they dangerous? They are dangerous because they have really sharp teeth and they will protect their babies very fiercely. So if uh, somebody is trying to hurt their babies or even just get close to their babies, they will bite and they've got really strong jaws. So a bite from a seal can really hurt. Margarita asked, how did the army use them? The army used them for training and for uh, uh, 
exercises where they needed to put things underwater. The seals are really good at carrying things underwater because they're so strong and they can hold their breath for a long time. <laughs> Heath asked, do they use the bathroom? Well, they do. They will just go in the water. They don't really have like a toilet like some people have. Uh, Tristan said Navy SEALs. That's right. They were Navy SEALs. Rianne asked, why do they use their back flippers? Their bodies are a different shape than sea lions. These are what we call true seals. True seals have wider hips and smaller uh, leg bones, which means that they can't really walk on land like a sea lion can. So they are relatives, but they've got different body shapes. Maddie asks, how do they steer? They use their tail and their flippers to steer and they can change directions pretty quickly. Heath asked, can they speed? Yeah, so the sea lions can go about 35 miles per hour or about 57 kilometers per hour. Awesome, great questions, everybody. Well, somebody asked, uh, somebody asked, what eats them? And the only animals that really eat them are killer whales or orcas, as some people call them, or this animal right over here. <laughs> That's right. I see Eleanor got it. They are polar bears and polar bears will eat seals. Polar bears love seals. It's their favorite food. Polar bears are very strong animals, and they are very big and powerful. They've got lots of muscles that help them catch and eat really big animals like seals. But polar bears are carnivores, and they will eat things like fish and animals on the land. But if they can find a seal, that's what they're going to eat. Now, polar bears are endangered too. They are endangered because of climate change. As the world gets hotter, the ice that they live on gets smaller and smaller. And so they have no place to live as their habitat shrinks. These polar bears that we have at the zoo are here because they are endangered. We have a mother polar bear named Crystal and two baby polar bears. They are uh, named Kalik and Kalu, which is uh, Inuktitut for uh, thunder and lightning. <laughs> yeah, so we had those two babies born here so that if the species goes extinct in the wild, we can bring the animal back. And we have done that with a couple of animals before around the world. All right, let's get to some of those questions. Eden asked, do they eat snow? Not really. They will drink water when they're thirsty. And then if they're hungry, they're going to eat animals. Maggie asks if the babies are twins. They are, absolutely. They are twin boys. Polar bears usually have twins. It's rare for them to have one birth at a time. How big are their paws? Their paws are about one foot long or about 33 centimeters. Callie asked, do they eat apples? Yes, they eat apples here at the zoo, but there are no apples in the Arctic in the wild. We give them apples because those are a healthy treat that they like here at the zoo, but if they were in the wild, they would never see apples. 
Brianne asked, do they get the zoomies? <laughs> Sometimes they do. The twin boys, they get them more than the mom does. The twin boys have lots of energy and the mom is a little bit tired because she's an old polar bear, but she is still a really good mom. You can see they love to swim and that's where they like to play. It's a nice day here in Toledo. So they are enjoying the weather. Margarita asked, are they rescued? These ones are not rescues, but they are part of what we call a species survival plan, meaning that uh, if the species does go extinct, this will be the animals that can bring the population back in the wild. Here comes the baby jumping. Oh, look, big splash. <laughs> Very exciting. I'm glad we got to see that. <laughs> Eden asked, do they fight? They do, but not to hurt each other. Baby animals sometimes will play to learn how to survive. So these baby brothers will fight with each other, but they're not trying to hurt each other. They're just learning how to use their muscles. Brianne asked, how long can they hold their breath? They can hold their breath for several minutes, I believe it's about eight minutes at a time. So not as long as the seals, but pretty long for an animal that doesn't live in the water. You can see, oh, look, we got a great look at them. Hello. Oh, how long do they live? In the wild, they might live to be about 15 to 20 years old. In captivity, they sometimes live to be about 20 to 25 years old. Our female polar bear, Crystal, is very healthy, and I believe she is 29 years old. So she is a really old polar bear, but she's still doing really well because we take good care of her here. Ooh, how does their blubber keep them warm? Blubber is a type of body fat, and it's a layer of thick fat underneath their skin. And that's going to create a space between the cold air and their body. The bigger that space, the harder it is for them to get cold. So it's going to trap the heat inside of them. How tall are they? Our babies are about seven feet tall when they stand on their hind legs. So they're already taller than me. Our mom, Crystal, is about nine feet tall on her hind legs. And their dad, who lives in Detroit, he is 10 feet tall when he stands on his legs. So they are the biggest type of bear and the biggest carnivore that lives on land. Margarita asks, how old are the twins? The twins are one year and four months old. Oh, I see, I see. Someone's asking, yes, they use the bathroom like other animals do. They'll just do it in the water or on land. We do have some animals who like to uh, create a sort of specific place where they like to go, uh, but most animals just go wherever they want. Eden asks, why do they like the water? Well, the water is nice and cool, which is the temperature that they like, and it's also fun to play in the water. So just like how we sometimes play in the water, so do they. Christopher Lee asks, is the water they are playing in kept really cold? It is kept cold, but not super cold. So they don't like it to be like almost freezing, but they do like it to be colder than most of us would like. Eden asks, what do they do in summer? In summer, we let them uh, play in the pool and we make sure that their inside space is air conditioned. So it's cool in here for them in the summer, even if it's hot outside. 
These are some great questions, everybody. I want to make sure we have time to see some more animals. So I am going to hand it back to Lydia in the aquarium. And we'll say goodbye to now. Goodbye for now to our polar bears. All right. I am here at the 90,000 gallon tank, which is our biggest tank in the aquarium. And you can see there are, it's kind of cloudy today. The aquarium's not actually open, so it's a little cloudy, but you can see there are a bunch of different animals in here. You might have seen some sharks swimming by, and that was a unicorn fish. Um, but these particular species, uh, one of these sharks is endangered. Uh, the one that's about to swim by, that is a black tip reef shark. And they are not endangered, but this, there you are. This one is a zebra shark and it is endangered. So sharks, there are a lot of sharks that are endangered and a lot of the big sharks like the great white shark and the hammerhead shark are endangered and they are endangered because of overfishing. So humans, kill about 100 million sharks a year and sharks kill about five people a year. So humans uh, are killing a lot more sharks than sharks are killing humans. You just hear about the uh, shark attacks in the news because they make good news articles, but you're actually more likely to be killed by a vending machine falling on you or from falling out of a chair. So sharks are overfished, which means that people catch them. Uh, they like to make shark fin soup in other countries uh, where they just need the fin of the shark and they use it in other parts of the body for medicinal purposes. Um, so they're hunted a lot for that. They're also hunted, you can eat them. They are fish, uh, so they can be hunted for their meat. And sometimes they're just hunted uh, if people are scared of them or angry with them. Like if somebody got attacked, they might go out and try and kill the first shark they see, um, which is not as common anymore. Yes, <laughs> that's a question we always get in this tank. In this tank, yes, there are sharks and those reef sharks do eat fish, but they do not eat the fish they are swimming with. And this is why. We feed them uh, every day so they have plenty of food in their bellies, so they're not hungry. And even if they got a little bit hungry, sharks like to conserve energy, so they don't wanna use very much energy. Uh, they have to keep swimming to move water over their gills, so that's why they're swimming, but they don't wanna go chase a fish all around this tank to try and catch it because if you, you can see these fish are not huge fish. So if the shark chases a sh fish all the way around the tank and then finally catches it and eats it, well, the shark might've used more energy chasing the fish than it gets from actually eating the fish. So they don't try to spend any extra energy. Uh, so that is why they don't eat the fish in here because they're well-fed, their bellies are full and they don't wanna waste their energy chasing a fish when they know that they're gonna get fed uh, dead fish by the keepers. But that was a great question. Um, the sharks do not fight each other, uh, at least not in here. These guys are mostly always just doing this. <laughs> they like to swim. Usually they'll go in uh, different circles around or different ways, but they have to keep moving again uh, to move that water over their gills so that they can breathe. So that's why they're moving a lot, uh, the reef sharks. Oh, there are a lot of different fish in this tank, more than 10 different kinds. But uh, some of the ones that most people recognize are the sharks, like the zebra shark, the reef black tip reef shark, uh, there is another species of shark in here, but they usually hide on the bottom and they're really hard to find. They're called epilep shark. Uh, there are the surgeon fish, which are the dory fish. And there are a bunch of different, uh, 
there's angelfish, there's uh, Moorish Idol, which is another one that was in Finding Nemo. There's a whole bunch of different tangs in here, so lots of different fish. Uh, let's see. So there are no great whites in captivity, so no Bruce. Uh, we have, I think, five, six different kinds of sharks here. But the zebra shark is the largest. Is that one the shark? And so Nemo, we do have a Nemo, yes. Uh, they're not actually in the same tank. How do they sleep? So uh, different uh, fish sleep differently. For sharks, let's see. How do sharks sleep? Well, I'll get back to you on that one. Let me look it up. I can help you out, Lydia. Yes. Some sharks can sleep uh, about 12 hours a day, and they will sleep when it is nighttime or when they are just tired. Those sharks don't have to keep swimming like the sharks that you see right now do, because they can breathe oxygen in like other fish can. The sharks who have to keep swimming, those sharks actually don't sleep, but they do sometimes just swim without thinking a lot. Ah, uh, okay. I was gonna say, I don't think that these ones sleep, but <laughs> yes, that makes sense. All right, and Timothy has another animal for you guys to check out. I do. I was hoping we could see our wolves, but they are hiding today. But we can see our giraffes. Giraffes are the tallest animal on land, and there are a lot of giraffes in here. Our tallest giraffe is about 18 feet tall. And they are really powerful animals. They have strong legs and strong necks. And they are endangered because people take away their habitat. So when people cut down the trees that these giraffes like to eat, they can't find enough food to stay healthy. So we can help these giraffes by, uh, by replanting the right kinds of plants in Central and Northern Africa that these giraffes like to eat. Now, giraffes are a type of animal that is very cute, but we have to remember that animals that are in the wild should stay in the wild. So just like with the seal, even though they are cute and sometimes playful, you want to make sure you give them their space. Eleanor and Maggie both asked what they eat. Their favorite type of leaf is the acacia leaf. The acacia leaf, oh, here is our baby. <laughs> this is Franklin. Hello, Franklin. Franklin came right up to say hello to you all. <laughs> Pretty cute. They have really long tongues, which they use to grab leaves. And those tongues are black and purple so that they don't get sunburn on their tongues. <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions about giraffes? All right. Well, I don't see any questions about, oh, one question. Why do they have spots? Those spots help them camouflage. It helps them hide 
between trees and out against the grass. So a giraffe can't really hide in grass if you're close to the giraffe. But if you are a far way away from them and you're looking where they are, if you're far enough away, they will blend in with the grass and the sand. What is the lifespan? They can live to be, I believe, about 40 years old. <laughs> the things on their heads are called ossicones, O-S-S-I-C-O-N-E-S. -S -E they are like horns, but they are different because they're made out of bone. And they use those to add some weight to their head so that when two male giraffes fight, they fight by swinging their necks at each other. And those heavy horns are going to make them stronger. <laughs> what are the giraffes' stories? Uh, these giraffes, most of them were born at a zoo. They are not rescues, but they are part of a species survival plan. So that's why we have some babies here. Um, for some of our peoples. How long are the necks? The necks can be about 10 feet or three meters long. Very long. All right. Well, I think that Lydia has one more exhibit to show everyone. So I am going to say goodbye uh, and hope you enjoy what Lydia has to show you all six feet long yeah all right so real quick this guy is not endangered but he was in the light so i wanted to show you him because he's pretty cool this is our giant pacific octopus named walter and you can see he has eight legs like all octopus do but he's not actually an endangered species i just wanted to show you guys because usually he's hiding in the dark corner but right now he wanted to be in the light He's probably going to get some food soon. That's probably what he wants, usually when he goes towards the top. All right. Now, on to the coral tanks. So, coral. Uh, a lot of you might think coral is a plant. Or maybe you think coral is a rock but coral is actually an animal. So coral is an animal and they have a symbiotic relationship with uh, little tiny algae. So coral will filter feed, so they will eat things that are in the water that are very small, um, but they will also uh, have this relationship with algae so that the algae uh, can produce energy from the sun because algae is a plant. And then the coral can use some of that energy that the algae produces. So they kind of have two ways of getting energy. And you can see all this nice, healthy coral in here. And right now around the world, not all of our reefs look like this anymore uh, because coral is dying uh, due to changes in the temperature, due to uh, pollution, due to people uh, knocking them, like walking through or knocking them down. Uh, they are very fragile and they're very, very hard to grow. So they take a very long time to grow and they're very difficult to grow. These are all actual real coral that the zoo has grown, uh, which is not easy. We have a special uh, person who is in charge of growing the coral and they need a lot of different things like just the right light, just the right salt, uh, salt content in the water. Uh, let's see, a question of what eats coral. Uh, there are definitely animals, some that will eat coral, so like fish, 
uh, some barnacles, crabs, snails, things like that will eat the uh, insides of corals, the soft part. Uh, but that's not the reason they're going extinct. So the colors of the coral is going to be uh, mostly from the algae that they have a relationship with. Um, so those are plant-based uh, things. So they get their energy from the sun. And that's why they're such vibrant colors. Because coral reefs are found in shallower water where the sun can reach them. Uh, and that's the important thing is the sun does have to be reaching them. Ah, so when they turn gray or white, that's called coral bleaching, and that's when they die. All right. There are also some fish in here. So they have a strange way of eating. They uh, are filter feeders. So if you think of like a sponge and water can pass through a sponge and the sponge could soak up some of the uh, nutrients, I guess you'd say, if there was nutrients in the water. They're kind of like that. Uh, so they kind of filter water through and they take out the nutrients that they need. So coral bleaching is uh, not caused by bleach. It's just a word we use because the coral turns a uh, whitish color. Um, but it's when the, to the coral gets stressed or the temperature is wrong or the nutrient amount is wrong and uh, they end up dying. And when they die, they kind of turn white. Uh, and that is why we call it uh, coral bleaching. Clownfish, there is a few clownfish that live in this tank, but they like to hide all the way in the corner, so sometimes you can see them, sometimes you can't. I don't know where they are at the moment. They hide around that corner there. I don't know why they like that spot so much, but there are a few that do live in here. But yes, clownfish like to live on coral reefs. Oh, there are many, many different types of coral. I do not know the exact number, but somewhere in the hundreds. Well, let's see, I think I answered all those questions. All right, so a few other animals we can take a look at is the, well, native to Ohio. So in Ohio, we have, where are you? Oh, there you are, sturgeon. So this is a lake sturgeon. And lake sturgeon are native to Ohio. So they live here in Ohio, they live in the Great Lakes and they are endangered. And we do a special program here at the zoo where we will collect sturgeon eggs and we will raise them until they're a little bit bigger. And then we let them go back into the wild. Uh, and we even have a little fun slide that you can slide a sturgeon down into the uh, river. So that's really fun. All right, I want to make sure Timothy uh, gets to say, say the last bit for you guys in case he has anything else. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you so much, everybody, for coming here today. It has been a lot of fun getting to talk to you all. And, and I hope we were able to answer your questions and that you got to learn some new things about these animals. So thank you for coming, and I hope you have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I thought I was unmuted there. Thank you so, so much. We are so grateful for all of the information that we learned today from both of our wonderful teachers and all of the wonderful questions from our learners today. Thank you so much for your contributions. 
We want to remind you that your learning with the Toledo Zoo does not need to end here. In fact, you actually can go and click the link I just dropped into the chat, and you can see all of the wonderful virtual field trips. You can schedule with them. You can jump into so many different topics, learn about different animals, so much fun. And you can even have your cameras and microphones on if you'd like. So go ahead, click that link so you can continue your learning with them. We also want to remind you that tomorrow we're back at the same time. We're going to be connecting with a national park to learn more about the innovative Floating Freedom School to help celebrate Black History Month. So hopefully you've already reserved your seats, your virtual seats. And if you haven't clicked that link, go ahead and register and we'll meet you tomorrow at the same time we met here this afternoon where I find myself. We want to say thank you so, so much to our partners at the American Society for Deaf Children for being able to provide the wonderful interpretation today. And a many, many thanks to Miss Melissa. Thank you so, so much for being here today and helping with all of the wonderful teaching and learning. We hope to talk to you all soon and connect with you tomorrow and later this week for Community of Learning. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.